In this video, I try take to the field and review the Nikon 58mm 0.95 Noct Beast. It's not really have a beast in the name, but yeah, it is a beast. Let's roll the intro. Welcome to the review of the 58mm Noct 0.95 lens. Okay, let's sit down and chat. What this review is gonna be and what this review is not going to be. In this video, I'm gonna tell you how I found shooting with this lens in video mode, in daytime and nighttime, as well as in slow motion video mode. And then I'm gonna jump through into shooting time lapses on this very lens in daytime and nighttime, which was quite challenging actually, but we're gonna get to that. And how these sections will work is that I'm gonna show you some video that I captured with this lens in that scenario. And then I'm gonna talk through about all the challenges and findings from shooting with this lens in that kind of mode. And then we're gonna move on to the next mode. If you're only interested in watching one of the modes, then go into the description of the videos. I put the timestamps when I talk about video, slow-mo and time-lapse of this lens. The one thing I'm not gonna really review is photos because they are magnificent and every other photographer that potentially had this lens and will test it will speak about its photo qualities. I love this lens for taking a few photos, so that's it, that is my photo review. And now we can follow on how this video creates an emotional, cinematic, out of this world vibe when shooting video, slow-mo and time-lapse. But let's start from the basics. Let's do the unboxing first. Okay, so this is the box. I don't do unboxings too often, so let's get it done and over with pretty quickly. Inside the main box, we get another smaller box, branded Nikon, Nikol, uh, and that is pretty exciting. Let's go through the second box. Oh, what do we have here? A booklet, Nikon Noct. Uh, manual, warranty, the ultimate lens. I'll take a photo of that and let you read it if you want to, uh, if you pause the video. Yeah, that's that. And I use a manual in multiple languages. And now, the unraveling of the main box. Ta-da, the main Pelican case. So this is what happens when you open the box. The lens, the lens, the lens, the lens. Ooh, baby, that is heavy. But I've opened it before, so I know how heavy it is. And we got a hood that we can attach. And that's it. Nothing else in the back in the box. There's some. Um, just empty slots in the Pelican case that you can use for other stuff, I guess filters or whatnot. But yeah, that's pretty much it. And that's that, we got the lens. Nifty one, not quite a nifty 50, but yeah, a nifty little lens. But you may be asking, what is the 58 millimeter knocked 0.95 lens? Well. Let's uh, start with a bit of history. Back in 1970s, Nikon released a 58 mm f1.2 lens, and they called it the Noct, which most likely stands for nocturnal, which is like animals that live at night and sleep during the day. Oh, there you are. Basically, this lens 
pays homage to the original 1970s Noct lens because of the Z-mount being the largest mount for any full-frame cameras, definitely mirrorless as far as I know. They now allow for a magnificent less than f1, 0.95 actually, aperture and amount of light to go into the sensor. So it was only right to call it again the Noct. And that's quite a big thing actually. This lens has an aperture of 0.95. And if you think of fast apertures like 1.4, 1.2 is a third stop faster than that. And a 0.95 is another five sixth stop faster than 1.2. So a 0.95 is actually faster by a full stop and one sixth of a stop than a 1.4. So it's an immense amount of light that this lens lets into the sensor while also creating this almost larger than life effect of depth of field. While I'm standing about nine meters, from this lens. It's madness that it can still blur the background. You sticked around long enough, so let's reveal the price. Yeah, it's crazy. But this kind of lens is more an experiment, an experiment that Nikon sells, and I don't think how long they will actually sell it for. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, in the near future they actually discontinue this lens, then the lens value actually increases as well as any rentals of the lens increase. And it will become this lens that one day you could have bought, but you probably didn't, because most likely I am also never gonna buy this lens. But what I do believe that this lens actually is, is that they got the R&D department and the technology department to develop something that will sort of lead their way onto future lenses that potentially will not be 0.95, but they will be more affordable. Hopefully, well, I'm hoping actually somewhere in the region of like a 1.2, 50mm or 58mm, don't mind really, in a price range of about 2,000, 2,500. So I do hope that this lens helped to either reduce this price, make the optics better on the future lenses that are not necessarily as fast, but make them smaller or just make quality of these lenses better by really testing and seeing if Nikon can deliver and can make such a lens like this one happen and they did and you can buy it if you're the sultan of brunei or somewhere so you know even if i don't see myself ever probably buying this lens there are options to rent it for particular projects that you might be shooting and it seems to be going around 350 for a three day period or about six seven hundred for a whole week and even if you will rent it for a prolonged period of time, more than two weeks uh, or, or a month, I think it's still better to actually buy this lens as uh, the amount of value you would spend on it. I don't think this lens will ever depreciate, will actually most likely rise in value like the original Noct still stands at, as far as I know, about two and a half, three thousand pounds you can get it on eBay. So yeah, I don't know how much it costed when it got first released, but a lens from 19. 70s still costing two and a half three thousand pounds is crazy yeah you won't lose money on this lens if you actually buy it and use it to make something unique hopefully some client work that kind of pays off for this lens predominantly in i guess portraiture but you know i say never but you never know you know uh, I never thought I'll actually have the 105 1.4 and yet it's my favorite lens. I love shooting with it and it was quite an expensive lens at 1600. So yeah, I guess you should never say never. Okay, first up, let's shoot some ProRes RAW. So here are some of the clips that I shot around Piccadilly Circus at night time, because just things look better in ProRes RAW at night time. All the city lights just come to life, even though it was ridiculously empty. All the images later on that I've processed in Final Cut Pro, unfortunately having to use the Canon Log2 profiles because there's still no ProRes RAW profiles for the Nikon Z6, so that's what I had to resort to. But these images coming out of that, you know, with my only basic color correction skills still look unbelievably beautiful so if you're shooting a project for a client hire this lens and you're gonna get some absolute magic cinema magic
Shooting in daytime 4K in body without the Atomos recorder was a bit easier, definitely lighter. So the filters that I had to use was the 8-stop Firecrest that I've got in 82mm or I was using, when it got a little bit darker, the Nissi 1.5 to 5-stops ND. And again, the images from it just look beautiful. When you move the focus slightly closer than Infinity, people walking in or walking through that point of focus make the video look like as if it's a moving okarama it is that unreal so i'll just let you enjoy the rest of the video Shooting in camera 4K during nighttime was a little bit more flexible because I was able to finally at some point take off the Nissi 1.5 to 5 stop ND filter and just shoot how the camera sees it without any filters mounted to them. And that sharpness that the lens can produce at nighttime at ISO 100, 150th of a second at 0.95 is insane. Enjoy. Welcome to the Barbican. I chose this particular spot just to say a couple of words because it provides nice leading lines behind me while everything behind me really still is obliterated in out of focus depth of field. While I'm here standing about eight meters away from the camera and I'm in focus and things behind me are in. This is how mad this lens is. I mean, bonkers. Was that the spot that I was meant to be in focus? Being in places like this, the leading hole market, when there's literally no one about, makes it feel so unreal. Is this cinematic enough? The slow motion clips that you're seeing now have been scaled up to 4K because the whole project and video uploaded to YouTube is in 4K. So let me dive into how I felt while shooting slow motion on this lens. 
Basically, first daytime shots, I still had to use the Nissi 1.5 to 5 stops ND, but once it got a little bit darker, I was able to take it off. And then at nighttime, I actually had to increase the ISO because shooting at 1 to 100th of a second, even at 0.95, was a little bit not enough light. So increasing ISO to only levels up to 400 allowed me to get still really nice and clean images. And if you're wondering what the hell am I doing here, well, this is a homage to the channel called Camera Conspiracies, where I really like the guy and how he tests slow motion. Seriously, that lens for time lapses? You're mad. Yeah, why not? I think it'll be pretty cool in different kind of time lapse scenarios. Of course, for time lapses, there needs to be a reason why you would want this kind of a lens and uh, why you would want to create a time lapse. Not like this, because there's nothing going on in here. There's a couple of people moving, not that exciting. But I will be taking it into other situations where I can have something in focus and then the background blurred out. Because with this ridiculous lens, you can actually be super far away, like I am now from this lens, and still the background behind me gets somewhat blurred. Yeah, I'm still shooting wide, which is mind-blowing. And you know what they say about time-lapse photographers, uh, we all just sit down and wait for the time-lapse to finish doing nothing. And that isn't quite a lie, actually, sometimes that happens. But as time-lapse photographers, we can actually use this lens to create some really interesting videos that you otherwise wouldn't be able to see. Welcome to Richmond Park. Today I'm shooting together with Charles hey. um, and we're gonna see if we can see the Milky Way in the center of London that is Richmond Park. Fingers crossed. Fingers are crossed. So Charles is today sliding into the lake to create some awesome perspective change right next to this bush over there. Two more cameras here while I'm keeping things simple. I'm gonna be shooting on this camera that's shooting currently with the 20 millimeter F1.8 S lens, the new lens that I'm trying for the next two weeks, as well as this beast. And this is what I'm really looking forward to testing today. Can we see the Milky Way with the nocturnal beast that is the 58 millimeter F 0.95 Noct? 
I manually set the focus where this bag is, so I should be in focus. Currently shooting on the 58mm at 0.95 and the tripod is quite a distance away from me. It's really dark, it's blue hour, but it's pretty pitch black here, yet at 16,000 ISO, this video is literally showing as if it was daytime. And this is exactly the time lapse I got on the 58mm Noct. It's definitely not ideal. The visibility of the Milky Way is something that does not work in central London. Here's a shot on the 20mm f1.8s that you can somewhat barely see the Milky Way much higher than the light pollution captured in the 58mm. And what positively surprised us was the fog that appeared early morning after staying there all night. You might have seen some other clips that I've included in the daytime section of the time lapse too. To provide a large variety of the nighttime time lapse capabilities of this lens, I headed to central London where I could capture the traffic and the beautiful red London buses moving, as well as people on their footpaths. Enjoy! And have you ever heard about Noctilus and clouds? I thought, what an amazing opportunity to capture them with the Noct lens. Unfortunately, for the whole duration of two weeks that I had the Noct lens, they didn't happen. Yet the day I returned the loan lens, they were happening for the next five days every night. So here's a few examples I shot on the 20mm, 30mm, 50mm and even 100mm. Because yeah, they were just happening every night and they do look beautiful. Okay, back in my own park now. So let's talk a little bit more about the details of this lens. Starting with the fact that it is a heavy lens. It weighs exactly two kilos uh, and that's just a lens. You've got to add the body that you're shooting either a Z6 or a Z7 on top of that. And you're just under three kilos. So it is a heavy setup. You add a plate to that that you will mount on whatever tripod you're using and it is a heavy setup. It does, however, fit size-wise into a man bag. And I found it quite useful just carrying one lens in the mad bag and it just folds perfectly fine. So size-wise, it's not a big issue. The weight, however, yeah, that's quite of an issue. All the time lapses that I showed you before, they were all shot at 0.95 because if we are to change the aperture to 1.2 or 1.4, yes, it will be superb. It will be probably fractionally better than shooting at 0.95, but I see no point because you can get a cheaper lens at 50, 58 millimeters and shoot at 1.4. So what's the point shooting with this lens if you're not gonna use the 0.95? And quite frankly, I've seen reviews of the 58 millimeter 1.4 that costs about 1600 pounds in the uk and unfortunately it looked and everyone on youtube said that at 1.4 it wasn't that sharp it was a little bit soft and it got better at f1.8 f2 and at 2.8 it was brilliant i can tell you that this lens at 0 0.95 is beyond amazingly sharp there's no fringing going on uh, around your subjects and that happens especially when you're shooting somewhere close but even if I shot something 10 meters away or 15 meters away at 0 0.95 there was no issues that are common when you have a fast lens and shoot wide open. 
I think this is really what they're charging this kind of money for this lens because it is superb wide open. It almost feels like they've designed like a lens that's 0.8 or 0.7 and just didn't use the wide openness, but only let people use it from 0.95 because it's already good at that. It is mind blowing how good it is wide open. That's all I can tell you. It's got two buttons on the lens itself. One is to turn off the display and turn it on. To be honest, never used it. Uh, but the other, the L-FN function is a customizable function that inside the Z6 body, I set for a two times magnification. So because I'm holding with my hand underneath the lens, it's always easier just to press the one button and with the, um, the viewfinder, I am straight away two times magnified for the manual focus. Oh yeah, and behind me now, you see my today's hairdresser because I just this morning got a beautiful haircut. What do you think? She did a great job. Yeah, but hopefully you will never become a hairdresser. Just pl please don't. Yeah, great, let's continue. <laughs> Something I just found out looking at this lens now, it's actually got a second ring. I haven't used it. I literally just used the front ring for manual focus, but I guess you can use the second ring for controlling aperture, shutter speed, whatever. Now I'm just used to really using them on the body. So eh, there's a second ring that you can customize and use for something. Didn't find it useful that much. So yeah, it's there, but no use for me. Because the lens is two kilos, so front heavy, uh, they decided to add a little leg that you screw all your plates to. Um, so I found it pretty convenient that actually, apart from the thread for where you thread in the, um, the, the plate, there's actually this little hole that uh, can secure on some of the plates that you have this second thing sticking out so that the plate will never move. This plate doesn't have it, uh, but some of my bigger plates, when I mounted this lens onto a professional video, big, heavy tripod, they do have the second bolt sticking out so that the plate will never move. Very convenient, actually, that it is there. Because it has the leg, it has the mechanism that if you unscrew this, you can actually, while the lens is on a tripod, you can just twist the lens and adjust the horizon or go vertical shoot with it, which is pretty cool. It's common to big long telephoto lenses, but to see that on uh, this lens, pretty decent. They probably added it just because they had to add the leg for stability rather than mounting this lens at the back. Um, so yeah, they've added the feature that you can twist it. I found it quite convenient, uh, even though predominantly I shoot with this geared head tripod where I have independent movements of every axis. So yeah, to me, it wasn't a big issue, but pretty cool that on standard tripods, uh, you can just untwist it and turn the camera sideways. Pretty cool. One small thing that I have to mention, I don't know if it's with every lens. This lens obviously is a loan that I had from Nikon in the UK for two weeks. And one thing that I found a little bit annoying is that on this uh, knob that you unscrew so that you can move the horizon of the lens, this uh, rubber thingy where probably the tech guys used to unscrew the lens and do something with it, started to just constantly jump out. Uh, maybe with new lenses, it doesn't happen as this is a loaner and a lot of people used it. Um, yeah, it seems to be quite easily coming out, but not a big deal really. And while we're still on the aspect of the heaviness of this lens, I gotta say, when I first got this lens uh, and I was like carrying it, I was quite scared to let it go, just always having, holding it underneath the lens and just holding it by the body uh, with the other hand. And with time I saw that actually it can stay just on the lens if you just hold it by the body, which was something I was like scared because this is so heavy. I thought it will actually break the mount. Do not quote me on this. If you one day buy this lens and you just hold it by the, uh, by the grip and one day it breaks, you know, I'm not responsible for that damage. It feels like it can hold it, but it is really front heavy. Don't know how and for what prolonged period of time it can hold it before the, the mount can break. I would still recommend it holding it underneath the lens, but it is, it is heavy. It, you know, feels really heavy. Um, so it's just best to securely hold it still underneath the lens, never 
for too long hold it just by the uh, camera grip. So another great feature of this lens is the fact that if you take the uh, hood of the lens, it's a standard 82 millimeter thread and all my screwing filters are 82 millimeters because some other lenses that I have are 82 millimeters and some of the lenses that are uh, less than 82 millimeters thread, I buy just cheap uh, one or two pounds off eBay uh, step up rings. So yeah, 82 millimeters is perfect. Okay, moving on to how to shoot daytime time lapses with this lens. Well, obviously at 0.95 uh, and wanting to achieve at least 0.6 seconds of a shutter speed every one second interval, well, I was faced with putting a lot of ND in front of the lens. Well, I've got the eight stop um, format high tech, um, screw-in filter that's 82 millimeters and it works perfectly on some other of my lenses and the fact that a 82 millimeter screw-in filter just fits in um, to the 82 millimeter thread and and the fact that the hood fits around it because it's got a separate thread uh, is great because everything is contained inside and this way I can even just put the lens down into my bag and the hood blocks anything from touching my filter element. So yeah, that's fantastic. But this is only eight stops. Unfortunately, uh, for daytime use, when I wanted to shoot at 0.95, even if I lowered the ISO to the low one, which is ISO 50, eight stops wasn't enough. Uh, I've worked out that I needed around 13 stops to be at ISO 50, uh, 0.95, and get the 0.6 of a second daytime long exposure. So what I had to do is take my square filters mount holder and screw it in front uh, because it's got an 82 millimeter thread. However, we came across an issue. When I screw it in and try to focus on infinity, the outer ring that holds the hood moves a bit forward. You can only really screw it when the focusing system is at around uh, seven feet. Once you move past 20 feet and infinity, it goes outside that thread. So what I had to come up with is an 82 millimeter to 82 millimeter, um, not step up ring, but it is a step up ring, but just really an extender, but it doesn't step up or down. It's just 82 to 82. I screw it first onto my square filter holder and that gave me a little bit of extra dimension. However, again, further issue, well, let's cut it short. You really need two 82 to 82 millimeter um, extension, step up rings, step down rings, step e equal rings, whatever they're called, uh, so that you are really gonna get to infinity. But all the time lapses that I try to do, I never wanted to focus on infinity. I always wanted to focus something about five or 10 meters away from me. So I really didn't have to push it all the way. But with just one 82 step up ring, I was able to screw it in. And when I almost got to infinity, I was able to attach this uh, filter holder somewhat halfway, not screwing it all the way, but just somewhat halfway, just so that when I screw the side bit in, it holds. And then I'm almost, I can't really go to infinity, but it gave me ability to focus on the sort of furthest object that I wanted to focus, that behind it, there's still a little bit of blurriness because of the depth of field this lens can achieve on quite a further distance. So then I was able to mount a free stop ND to, the, to one slot, uh, which is 10 stops, and 10 stops wasn't enough. So as I don't have a free stop ND filter, I had a free stop grad. So in the second slot, I was putting a free stop grad. Then uh, Charles, a friend of mine, borrowed me a 16 stop. Turns out that it, if you put a 16 stop, then even if you want just 0.6 of a second at the lowest ISO 50 at 0.95, Unfortunately, the 16 stop was too dark, so I had to raise the ISO to 800, which is not ideal. So I ended up just shooting in a bright daytime uh, conditions on the 10 stop, 
plus a free stop grad, which was mainly covering a little bit of the sky, but the ground floor was just fine. So this way I achieved roughly 13 stops, at least throughout the top half of the uh, image. And that was giving me the perfect um, amount of ND to shoot at 0.6 seconds during daytime. Just as a test, I also have a SERP 1.5 to 8 uh, stop ND. Uh, it's a variable ND. Unfortunately, I don't find this ND that great, but I just wanted to test it. And yeah, it fits just fine. You can put the hood over it, no problems. This, however, is my favorite variable ND filter. It's the Nissi 1.5 to 5 stops. And it fits also perfectly fine. There's no issues with focus at infinity. Um, so I used, goes to infinity, no problem. However, you cannot put the hood over it because it's got the convenient lever to um, adjust the power of ND. However, I shot with this filter during nighttime because shooting at 150th at 0.95, at ISO 100, because in video mode, on the Z6 at least, you cannot choose lower ISO than 100. It was uh, too bright in certain situations around, for example, Piccadilly, um, that there's a lot of light. So I had to actually put a variable ND in front and around 1.5 stops or two stops was just fine to get the perfect exposures. And this is the part of this review that I have to tell you that if you judge any of the clips that I showed you, the video ones or the time-lapse ones, that something is not perfectly right about them, there's some issues and uh, it doesn't seem as sharp as it could be, well, yes, because every single one of the videos that I showed you or the time-lapses were shot through some sort of a filter. The daytime time-lapses were shot through sometimes two different filters and I could straight away see that it wasn't just as sharp. The second, the grad that I have is actually not the best filter. I'm looking for a different grad that will be slightly better. That grad is actually degrading the quality of these images that they could look. But at 0.95, there is no other way to get the nice cinematic 150th uh, of a shutter for video or the 0.6 seconds at daytime for time lapses. Just, just there is no other way to achieve it without having ND. So these NDs could actually be dropping the quality a little bit. Um, photo wise, you can see photos. There will be other people that reviewed this lens for photos. They're phenomenal. I've shot some photos with it with no NDs where I could, was able to just adjust the shutter speed to get the right um, light and exposure. And these images are ridiculously sharp, but everything else, as I told you, I shot through filters. That is a variable that I cannot say did it actually represent the true image quality from this lens or did it degrade it a little bit. Going back to time-lapse, how is this lens actually for time-lapse? Well, as a Z lens, it unfortunately suffers from the same thing all the Z lenses suffer that if you set it to time-lapse, even the in-body time-lapse, either a interval of shooting raw images or even the in-body time-lapse movie mode that straight away converts uh, the file that it creates into a 4K. If you set it even in manual, either at wide open 0.95 or whatever other aperture, every time it takes a photo, it sets to that aperture and then either opens or closes. It does some weird stuff. It never really stays at that position for the whole duration of time-lapse. Even if you're shooting manual, which I find a bit frustrating, and it's just an unnecessary amount of uh, mechanical movements of the apertures inside, as well as each time it doesn't close to the same position, it can introduce flicker that's so unwanted in time-lapse. And this lens, just like any other Z lenses, does it the same, either wide open, uh, it does this that I can show you in this video. Um, between every shutter, it was opening, closing, opening, closing for absolutely no need. I didn't find a specific f-stop that it would stay at. When you compare this to uh, f-mount lenses that are adapted via the FTZ mount adapter, every fast lens, for example, like a 20mm 1.8, up to 5.6, in manual mode, the apertures don't move. Above 5.6, they actually move. They uh, open to 5.6 and then they close to, for example, if you set it to F8, and they will do that movement. 
but below 5.6, they actually stay in manual time-lapse at that f-stop. So I don't know why Z lenses cannot do that. There must be a reason, but I just haven't figured out. So, how I overcome this? Well, exactly how I overcome it with any other Z lenses that I shoot time-lapses. I get my settings, I see what aperture I need to be. In this lens, I knew that I will be shooting at 0.95, so I had to set it to 0.95, get my filters, get everything, and that set, and when I was shooting a one second interval, I knew that I have to be at 0.6 shutter. So what I did was quickly scroll into, let's say two or three second exposure, click so that the exposure started taking. And then with the press of a button, I was slightly, just slightly twisting off the body. The camera is still being held on the leg of the lens. So nothing was really happening. And I wasn't twisting far away to just detach the body. I was only really, unclicking it just slightly. And then, obviously, because I adjusted the horizon, I was either using the lens round knob here to adjust the horizon or the geared head. What happened there, where I disconnected the body from the electronics of the lens, is that the aperture stays at that f-stop. Everything gets disconnected, so you don't have any uh, autofocus on an autofocus lens. This lens is manual, um, and you cannot press the uh, lens function button that you previously, for example, preset for the two times magnification. All the electronics connected with the lens are disconnected. So you almost like operating a manual lens. The good thing about this lens is, as it's a manual lens, that your focus still works, even if you disconnect the electronics. On other Z lenses, the focus doesn't work uh, and the uh, aperture just stayed because you disconnected it at that point. So when you're unscrewing other lens, that's a manual lens in Z mount, you have to make sure that you do not touch the focus while unscrewing, because then the focus will stay and you can move the focus as much as you like, the focus will stay at what you unscrew the lens. Again, that's diverging into other Z lenses. With this lens, it's a manual focus. So when I disconnect it, mid taking a photo, I can still adjust a focus like on a manual lens just by pressing the back plus and minus button to get the magnification. Upon completing a time lapse in such a manual way, I just made sure that I click back the lens so it's properly attached when carrying the tripod. So now that I've covered pretty much everything, uh, how I shot with this lens, how I found this lens, let's just summarize it with positives I really like about this lens and a couple of negatives. And there is a couple of negatives, obviously. Starting with the positives, it's ridiculously sharp. Like I have to tell you that I'm surprised how sharp it is at 0.95. And for that reason, it is worth probably the money that they're charging for it. Will anyone using it for time lapses ever buy it? Most likely not. For nighttime video, for big cinematic productions, I see this lens has a market. Portrait photography, definitely. If someone has a high-end studio and charges clients enough to cover an expenditure of such a lens, then yeah, that lens is for that person. I could see myself every now and then maybe hiring this lens if a budget from a client allows for that and, I, and can be covered, because this will create some insanely cool stuff. Personally for myself, I don't know, will I ever use it? But it is a, a superb lens. What it can create during nighttime, the effect or in daytime, just the unrealness of the photo or the video is, is beyond any other lens that I've ever used. Right. Now the negatives, the negatives are very bit technical and quite a lot to do with what this lens is and the price. Yeah, obviously the price, it's ridiculously expensive. But even if you have that sort of money, you know, you go get yourself this lens. When I was going out with it, central London, I was always trying to go out with a friend and only a few times I went out with this lens myself. But when I did go out myself, I always tried to be safe with it, don't like, shout out and don't do vlogs uh, when I'm carrying this lens because it attracts unnecessary attention. But the main issue that I found about this lens is carrying it even in the man bag. This was ridiculously heavy. I started having a little bit of a back pain because man bag's not good if you're carrying something really heavy. Uh, one side of your back starts to be in pain a little bit. It was really heavy. 
For the weight of this lens, you could have two or three other smaller lenses in your bag and be more versatile. If you compare this lens to other existing and similar lenses, there is the 58 Nikon 1.4. But as I mentioned before, uh, throughout the reviews that I saw on YouTube, quite a lot of people said that at 1.4, it's not the sharpest. So it is quite a steep um, price for a lens that's at its wide open, isn't that sharp. Don't know if I would ever get that lens. I would kind of hope that Nikon one day will release a 1.4 or 1.2 ideally, 50 millimeter in the native Z mount, that they will take what they learn from this lens and release a lens that's about two, two and a half thousand pounds, let's say, but it's superb at 1.2 ideally, at 50 millimeters, or there's a spider walking from my lens. <sighs> Go on, mister. Anyway. But everyone's also aware of the Nifty 50, which is the standard Nikon 50 mm f1.8 in F mount that only costs 200 pounds, while there's the Z mount 50 mm 1.8, and it's a superb lens. I got to try it about last Christmas, I think, and it was a phenomenally sharp lens, especially at 1.8. However, it is 500 pounds, so it is two and a half times more expensive. But it seems like for the Z lenses, Nikon is making lenses that are ridiculously sharp at the wide open aperture. But knowing that it is only 1.8, yet sharp at 1.8, I think it validates the price of 500 pounds because from 1.8, it is sharp. Even if you increase it to f2, f2.8, you don't have to because you get a sharp lens at 1.8. While on the F mount version, the Nifty 50, that's 200 pounds, the 1.8 isn't that sharp. And just as I said, the 58 millimeter f1.4, apparently at 1.4, isn't that sharp. Neither it is even at 1.8. It gets sharper and nicer really from f2, 2.8. Uh, so at the moment, the best alternative that you can get to this lens is really the f1.8 50 millimeter S lens, the native Z mount lens. But you just have to bear in mind that it is one and five sixth stops slower than the 0 0.95, let's call it two stops there and there about. Is two stops a big issue? I personally don't think so because the Z6 having only 24 megapixels, it is a sensor packed with big pixels that can increase ISO and not introduce that much uh, noise. What you're missing out on is the extended depth of field and um, the bokeh that's behind the lens. It's not gonna be as creamy as a 1.4 or a 0.95, but as a lens that's got autofocus and is really sharp at 1.8, 500 pounds is, um, yeah, I think a bargain compared to 8,300. The only other alternative that I can recommend instead of this lens is the Nikko 105 millimeter 1.4, which I do have and I absolutely love that lens. It is sharp at 1.4. It's not as sharp as this at 0 0.095, but it's phenomenal. I shoot quite often with it at 1.4. It is a pricey lens, but it also offers, similar to this lens, depth of field on objects that are still quite a distance away from your camera if you're shooting at 1.4. It's also got an 82 millimeter thread that I can screw in all the filters that I've got in 82 millimeter size. So yeah, I do love that lens and it's significantly cheaper than 8,300, only being at around 1,600 as far as I know. And I think that's it. Uh, it was a long review. I think I said everything I wanted to say about this lens. I absolutely loved it. Would I buy it? No. I would probably spend that sort of money on different lenses that I could have probably three or four for that price. Did I love using it? Absolutely. This lens is a legendary lens. People will be talking in 20, 30 years time that Nikon did this lens in 2019 and my wild guess is they will probably at some point discontinue this lens, so it will be, we'll become the legend, as is the 58 millimeter 1.2 knocked from the 1970s. Thank you again for watching this rather extensive review. Hopefully it covered most of the things that I use this lens for. And if you've got any questions that I haven't mentioned and covered, uh, please write them in the comments and I will try to get back to you. On my channel, you will find things from walking around London and recommending 
best views as well as how to shoot time lapses in various situations and occasionally i also do gear reviews the kind of equipment that i use or get a chance to try and test like this legendary epic lens that the 58 millimeter 0.95 knocked is and if you lasted this long in this video please leave a like comment and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already as this all helps the channel helps me produce these videos for you that you hopefully will find useful and that's it for now thanks again for watching see you later Hello. now time to chill ah oh. like everyone's intro is like bouncy and it has something to it and like you want to like attract people like to show like mm -hmm. Why don't you change this to something like, what's up boys, it's your boy. Blum. Oh no, I don't like that. Oh no, no, that's never gonna happen. That's not gonna happen. What's up, boys, it's your Lund what's up guys, it's your boy London Viewpoint. It, it's your boy. <laughs> it's your boy. Seriously. <laughs> Suggestions from my children. How to improve my YouTube channel. It's your boy London Viewpoint. No, that's never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that, but